And the Kisan is somebody you remember three times a day. You don't need a doctor every day. You don't need a lawyer or a chartered accountant every day. But you need a farmer three times a day. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, 18 minutes is too short to teach the subject called soilless agriculture or hydroponics. But nevertheless, the idea is to spread an idea as to what hydroponics can do in the face of rapid urbanization. As we all know, this world is moving, everyone's moving towards cities. People have aspirations. People want to live a better life. People want everything close by which is available. There are innumerable reasons why people are moving into the cities and this is causing a lot of problems for public health and garbage as you see around even in Bangalore and so many other attendant problems including disease, breakouts of diseases and things like that. And most of the people who walk into the cities every day are people who are poor. First thing, they don't have homes to stay, they don't have proper sanitation facilities and they don't have food, leave alone good food, they don't have food to eat. Just because we live in a world where we're getting our three meals a day, we have taken it for granted that everybody is having three meals a day. It's not true, gentlemen. In a country like India, 200 million people are hungry, hungry, which is as bad as sub-Saharan Africa. Therefore, it is human duty to actually look at growing food at home in some way or the other. So I'm going to take you down in the next few minutes and show you what can be done. It's not about talking about problems. There is hope and I'm going to tell you what that solution is all about. Many years ago I had a dream and my dream was to see cities green, fully green, like when I'm landing uh, on a, on, I mean towards Bangalore airport when I'm landing I should see just green over the rooftops. I should see just vegetables and herbs and everything just absolutely green. It was my dream and I believe that hunger is absolutely unacceptable. Hunger is not acceptable. Hunger is the worst form of violence like the great Mahatma Gandhi said. And many a problems stems from hunger. So, today, the greatest challenge is also our greatest opportunity. How are we going to grow food within our cities and reduce the amount of carbon footprint? Because when food travels from miles together to reach your plate, the amount of diesel and petrol that is burnt is basically increasing the carbon footprint. Therefore, if we were to grow food within our cities, number one, when you grow and eat what you've grown, the, that's a different feeling. But when you go to the market and buy something, that's another kind of a feeling. You're not sure what you're going to be eating. Therefore, the idea is that we have to move forward and do something about it right now. You can see a picture here. Hungry man is an angry man, gentlemen, ladies. A hungry person always, out of hunger comes this violence. If you look at different studies of different criminals and different kinds of people, you will notice that whatever they have done has stemmed from poverty and hunger. It's that which actually creates most problems in the world. You can see there people in some part of the world how they are rushing for their food. You can see that on their faces. This can happen very soon if we don't start to act now. We got to do something quick and we can do it and it is doable and there is no barrier to entry to use this technique which I'm going to talk about. They say 1.5 million people around the world, 1.5 million people move into cities on a daily basis. They say by the year 2050, almost 65 to 8, 70 percent, I mean people say in different ways, but they say almost 65 to 80 percent of the people would be living in cities. The cities are unable to handle such a big influx of people because they have their own limitations. So finally it comes to food security. If the 
next world war will break out, it will only break out because lack of food and water. These are the two most important things. So how are we going to address the problem of food security? Now the real truth is that what's happening is farmers around, especially in our country, they are deserting agriculture. They, are, they find it no longer lucrative. They tell their children, go to the cities, get education, start working there. So what happens? If 80% of the people by 2050 are going to be staying in the cities, then who's actually going to till the land in the rural areas? Who? Therefore, it becomes the city dweller's job to produce food. Now, cultivate, cultivable area is shrinking, as we all know, and food prices are going up, obviously, due to shortages. And the people who walk into the cities are so poor, they, they just can't afford the, the, the cost of food inside the cities. So, solution, gentlemen and ladies, is urban agriculture. Now, there's something called simplified hydroponics, and I learned this technology from my mentor in America, Peggy Bradley. She runs a wonderful organization which teaches simple hydroponics. And she helped me set this up way back in 2008. This picture you see here actually shows you a picture of a lady who was, whose husband ran away from the family, leaving behind two small little children. And they lived in the city. They were so terribly uh, I mean, their life was so terrible because of what had happened. They had no food to eat. And she actually taught them how to start to grow food for sustainability and livelihood. The picture you see there is quite old, but it's the true picture of a lady with her two little kids whose life was brought back by this simple technology. Everything that we use in simple hydroponics is it's so simple that you can, you can grow your food at home using recyclable materials. Imagine a place like Bangalore. The number of, the number of uh, Coca-Cola bottles that we actually throw away into the garbage, that itself is a receptacle to grow plants. And it can be done using all kinds of recyclable materials and the substrate, because we don't use soil here, the substrate could be river sand, it could be volcanic rock, or it could be rice husk, or it could be sawdust, or any of these materials can be used as long as they are sterile to grow plants and to grow some good vegetable and herb crops at home. So using hydroponics, you can grow uh, plants that, uh, crops that are highly nutritious. There are no heavy metal traces. Today what we eat contains a lot of heavy metal traces. We don't realize, we pay so much of money to eat poison. And then we have uh, no microbiological microbiolo contamination, which itself is good news. And then it can be grown pesticide free using simple things like garlic spray, turmeric spray, chili spray, and uh, neem spray and things like that as preventatives so that you don't get pest and disease. There's hardly any fertilizer residue which will harm people. And the best part is any open space with sunlight can be used to grow crops. All you need is God-given free sunlight and some clean water to grow your crop. Since there is no need for soil, every non-arable land becomes arable land. So when you say agricultural land is shrinking, it means within the cities we have millions of square feet of rooftop space where you can grow much more than what you grow in normally in soil. So that's good news for all of us that we can actually grow good food within the cities in any open space. So as I said, you can use recyclable material, locally available growing media, and the best news is it only uses 10 to 15 percent of the water that is used in comparison to soil cultivation. And you know water is becoming more and more scarce. So this technology helps us to, use, to grow plants using the lowest amount of water that, that, is, that is required. And the best part is no fossil energy of any kind at all is needed. Not one watt of electricity. And it's, such, it's easy to learn, it's not rocket science, and everybody can master it. So where are, where are the places where we can do this? Rooftops, balconies, even window sills can be used to grow a few plants. Empty spaces within buildings, open spaces lying unused are all spaces, like in the city we have a lot of plots, you know, some people don't build, they just have plots lying around. 
those can be given to communities or people who have no jobs. Bring them there, teach them how to grow, grow and they can also get sustenance and livelihood out of this technology. And who are the people who will be involved? Community farming, the poor can be employed. Individual rooftops or balconies, uh, balcony farming is possible. Gated communities, you know, you have gated communities with 100 buildings, all tall buildings. They can all be uh, segregated and you can say four of these buildings will produce tomatoes. This will produce cucumbers. This will produce capsicum. That way, you can bring all the vegetables down every day and the gated community, uh, the people who live in the gated community can actually eat fresh vegetables. Many times fresh is used very loosely. Fresh, in my opinion, is actually when you harvest, it should reach the customer's plate minimum within six hours. That is fresh. So now there are new concepts where people are renting the roof from people and growing, and they pay them lease amounts and things like that. So that's another thing that's happening at the moment. Here you can see passive heating, no fossil energy. You see those Coca-Cola bottles hanging out there? Those bottles are basically they're painted black. They have sand in them. And in cold countries, what, you, what happens is in the daytime, these bottles actually, the sand absorbs the heat. And in the nighttime, to avoid freezing inside the greenhouse structure, they give out heat. So here you can see there's no, not a single watt of electricity that's required. You can use wall spaces to grow plants like this. You can do rooftop gardening with whatever you have lying around at home, old paint drums and things like that. You can have community gardens like this where you have empty plots and use empty spaces lying around vacant. You can see this little garden. This is a garden that I first did in Bangalore for an orphanage, which was attached to a very poor Christian school in Bangalore. There were 20 students whom I trained how to grow their own food. And the best part is in, in 100 square feet area, you can actually get assorted vegetables up to one kilogram a day in 100 square feet. And that means if you have an acre of land, you would be producing 400 kilograms of vegetables every single day from one acre. Now, what we are enjoying today is not what we got from our previous generations. It is what we are stealing from you, the younger generation. That's what I always tell people. We are not enjoying what we got as a legacy but what we are stealing from the next generation. So it is time that we teach young people, and I'm so happy to be speaking here where there's maximum young people here. You are the future. You have to take this forward and do what you can. It's our responsibility. It's not somebody else's responsibility to feed us in the future. We got to start working together. Like I said, 100 square feet produces almost one kilogram of vegetable, which is enough to feed about four to six people in a family. And these have been proven in several projects that I've done in India and people who have done it outside. Every rooftop is prime agricultural land. So remember, if you see an empty space after this lecture, just go for it. Every city has millions of square feet that can be devoted to growing food. Every city can be self-sufficient in its vegetable and herb requirements. And a final, uh, as a final message to my friends, let me tell you that Feed, good food is everyone's birthright. Everyone must have good food and clean, healthy, nutritious food. I did a project long ago in a hospital called Satya Sai Hospital, which is a multi-speciality hospital in Whitefield. The pitch which I did to the doctors there was, I'll teach you guys how to make pesticide-free food using cheap material, simple stuff, including even old car tires for that matter, which can be used as containers to grow food. And they said, okay, what about it? So I said, look, you guys, you treat your patients and then you ask them to recuperate in the hospital and you give them pesticide-laden vegetables every day. I'm telling you that if you were to give this kind of best quality, highly nutritious, heavy metal-free, pesticide-free food, I think your patients will get better faster. And they said, okay, we'll have a look, we'll try. And then for three years, I trained 15 resident nurses and 15 resident doctors and they tried it for three years and in the fourth year, they surprised me with photographs wherein I saw the nurses carrying palak, methi, and different kinds of things and giving it to the dietary department. It took three years, but it happened. What I'm trying to tell you is we... <laughs> we... 
what I'm trying to say is we, we can make a difference. All of us can make a difference. And growing a plant, gentlemen, I am not from an academically, from an agricultural background. If I as an ex jawan or a military man could do it, anybody can. It does not need, it's not rocket science, it is something everybody can do. It's like bringing up a small baby. No mother goes to a school to learn, how shall I bring up my baby when it comes to this earth? It's the same way, when you put a seed, you can be sure that seed will grow and give you something. Therefore, gentlemen, it's our duty to actually look at the science. And it is so easy to learn, and I teach hundreds and hundreds of people in this country how to grow food. There are four Sri Lankan students coming day after tomorrow where I'm taking a five-day workshop to teach them how to grow simple hydroponic food. So that, you can imagine, that means people are getting more and more interested and they understand why they should be growing food at, in the cities itself. There's so much that can be done. I trained a student of mine who was a naturalist from the Bandhavgad National Park. That was about six years ago. He's a naturalist. He learned. He went back into the jungles and he taught tribal people how to grow leafy vegetables using this method. And Bandhavgad National Park happened to have a lot of these uh, Tata-owned uh, lodges and resorts where lots of foreigners come. And he sent me a picture where poor tribals were making vegetables and selling this to those lodges and earning a livelihood out of it. And they were even eating good food as well. So what I'm trying to bring out here is that there is hope that every challenge brings an opportunity. And the greatest challenge that we have today is how are we going to feed our, our brothers and sisters in this world? We all have to do it ourselves. I implore you that all of you must somehow grow at least one plant, at least one plant at home, and say proudly that, look guys, I'm eating pesticide-free food, I grow this myself, and then it becomes a revolution. Once people see you do it, others will do it. You got to be the example that you set to the world. For me, even today, I, if you come to my place in Dharwar where I live, you will notice that I grow my own vegetables at home. And it's such a pleasure when I need two green chilies, when I need one tomato, I just go and pluck. It's such a feeling. It's such an amazing feeling. I'm so glad that I, every time that I can talk about this subject, I really, really want more and more people to do what our grandma and our grandpa did in the backyard many, many, many years ago. They grew their own vegetables. I still remember my mom going across the compound wall and asking her neighbor, can you give me some methi? I've got this. Can you, you can take this and I can take that barter system. So I'm thankful to you all and Ted for giving me this wonderful opportunity to speak about this subject. And I must say, you're a great crowd and be the same way. Thank you.